Um, I'd also just like to quickly refer to the United Nations Charter because the, this is now the, I suppose, the primary source of law uh, in the world and governs what we, every nation does in relation to every other nation. It was signed in 1945 and every nation who signed up to the United Nations agrees to do a number of things. And it's important they are mentioned here under 2.3 and 2.4. These are the purposes of the United Nations and the agreements they make. All members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace, security and justice are not endangered. And all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Now, in all three wars, and in particular in the Iraq War, the British government claimed authorization by the United Nations Security Council. The government at the time said that this was authorized by the United Nations Security Council operating under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And in specific uh, terms, it was quoted by the Prime Minister and the Attorney General, Resolutions 678, 687, and 1441, all of which were United Nations Security Council resolutions, gave the authorization for <coughs> invasion and occupation in Iraq. Uh, that I challenge. And on a number of bases, it's important to understand that, first of all, the Security Council the United Nations is a peacekeeping operation. Any use of armed force is illegal. And we have been trained and conned for 60 years into believing that the United Nations can use armed force. That is totally incorrect. In relation to the war with Iraq, what is, and chapter 7, chapter 7 is article 39 and 51 of the UN Charter. And if you look at the top of the next page, you'll see point 41. The Security Council may decide what measures not involving the use of armed force are to be employed to give effect to its decisions. And it may call upon the members of the UN to apply such measures. These may include complete or partial interruption of economic relations of rail, sea, air, postal, telegraph, radio, and other means of communication and the severance of diplomatic relations. Now the crucial phrase is not involving the use of armed force. Our government for 60 years has ignored that phrase and left it out of its legal advice. And I find that fundamentally incorrect and a fundamental deception of the British people and of the world. Could I ask um, why when um the UN Security Council uh, both the British government said that they it, it was okay with the UN. So how comes the UN after they started the war didn't suddenly put their hands up and go, well, what are you doing? It's a very good point. I mean a lot of people think that the UN should be monitoring and guiding this. Unfortunately the United Nations is is really run by the Security Council. It should be the other way around. It's the General Assembly that has the ultimate authority, and they appoint and set up the UN Security Council. But America and Britain, in particular, have a, a real stranglehold over the operations of the Security Council. And I think it's something to do with the language. Uh, when you start looking at the language that is used in international discussions, and particularly over this, uh, the British, because it's English, are seen by foreigners who English is their second or third language to have a good understanding of what the words mean. And we are adept at misinterpreting the words of the UN Security Council. And the members of the UN 
um, uh, come from all sorts of countries, and they look up to the English in particular to help them understand the meaning of the phraseology. And so we have a, a powerful, insidious effect on the interpretation of the law. And secondly, the United Nations, the UN Secretary General, is appointed by other people, and he feels, well, certainly uh, the last three or four of them have felt incapable of really saying no to Britain or America. Kofi Annan tried to say no. Uh, there was a few things in the, uh, in the newspapers about it, but quite honestly, Britain just totally ignored it, and so did America. And uh, they have the power. So, I think we have a lot of problems to overcome in the United Nations. Can I just clarify the process point here? I think Chris is outlining um, about the process he's outlining now, and then James' defence, and then panel questions afterwards. So yes, say what okay. questions want to that, that would help us move along. Thank you very much. I suppose basically, really, what I wanted to do was just move on to, if I may, the United Nations Security Council and the United Nations General Assembly. There is an important bit of law, and I'm going to refer to an extract from UN General Assembly Resolution 2625. Uh, a little bit of history. What happened was that uh, during the Vietnam War, questions started to be asked about the legality of the American intervention in Vietnam, correctly. And the UN decided to appoint a legal group to have a look at it, the International Law Group. Uh, got together and for six years they looked at the law relating to the interpretation of the UN Charter. And in 1970 they came up with this Declaration on Principles of International Law concerning friendly relations and cooperation among states in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations. This was the first time since the uh, original 1945 Declaration of the Charter that, uh, that the law was clarified. And uh, there are, I put down here some of the statements in that that are still applying today. So we can apply it to the Libya war, the Afghan war, or any other occasion when the British government says it is authorized by the UN Security Council. The law is quite clear. Let's have a look at that first one. They restated it to say, every state has the duty to refrain in its international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Such a threat or use of force constitutes a violation of international law and the Charter of the United Nations and shall never be employed as a means of settling international issues. Now, if you ask a British lawyer, government lawyer, what is the law relating to war, they will never, ever mention that statement. And that, to my mind, is fundamental. Um, let's just have a quick look at some of the other ones. States shall accordingly seek early and just settlement of their international disputes by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements or other peaceful means of their choice. In seeking such a settlement, the party shall agree upon such peaceful means as may be appropriate to the circumstances and nature of the dispute. It seems to me that these statements are utterly clear and they need to be restated over and over again with our MPs, with our government lawyers, with others to ensure that everybody understands the law we have agreed to when we signed up to the United Nations Charter. Finally, the second from the bottom. No state or group of states has the right to intervene directly or indirectly for any reason whatever in the internal or external affairs of any other state. Consequently, armed intervention and all other forms of interference or attempted threats against the personality of the state or against its political, economic and cultural elements are in violation of international law. 
And lastly, they say, the principles of the Charter, which are embodied in this declaration, constitute basic principles of international law, and consequently appeals to all states to be guided by these principles in their international conduct, and to develop their mutual relations on the basis of the strict observance of these principles. Well, it seems to me that is fair as a bell. Right, that's, that's a very brief run through the law and uh, those laws that pertain to the use of armed force by Britain when it's invaded and occupied. Any more questions as well? Yeah, I'd just like to, um, when you say no state or group of states has the right to intervene directly or indirectly for, for any reason whatsoever in the internal or external affairs of any state. Um, when we look at something like um, Tripoli, places like that where people seem to be um, receiving the end of a, an unjust government, Syria, um, isn't it our duty to try and uphold their human rights? Well, I'm just relaying the law as it has been agreed by the world. And the world has said no state may intervene. So it's important for us to understand what is the law. If we know what the law says, and we can then make a decision as to whether or not we're going to break that law. Now our government constantly breaks it, but tells us that it is following the law. That's the problem. Because we don't know the law and what these statements are. Has anybody ever seen these statements before? And yet they're the most important ones, and we agreed when we signed up to them that we would ensure that every citizen had understanding of them so that we would never go to war again. <coughs> yet our government never does that. So in plain terms, what, what you're saying is that the British government, uh, in this particular case, and probably many others, has committed a crime of aggression. Absolutely. I and don't that. that. Just to clarify, uh, Chris, you've outlined the laws of war. Um, are you requesting you now about the laws of war, or are you, are you doing the next stage of the government's false assertion of legality and the reason why the government claims false? That's next, is it? If we can, yes. Oh, okay, well, I think that's very important to go into. But just on, on the laws of war, I think you know some of these wars, uh, laws, particularly the Kellogg Briand Act, I remember in a school history, but it's very important that every citizen is educated in these things because, you know, to avoid you know, the matters that we saw in, in the First World War. And, um, so these laws of war, particularly the UN, uh, the UN different uh, declarations and things were quoted quite a lot. Resolutions, the two main resolutions that I think the British government claimed gave them the right to go and invade Iraq. Um, well, three in fact. Um, which ones are we'll have a quick look at that right now because that's the case the government said was that uh, um, <coughs> the Attorney General gave advice to Tony Blair some two weeks before the war started. Lord Goldsmith. And Lord Goldsmith it was. And he said it would be legal under uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions 678. 6, 8, 7, and 14, 41. Now, 6, 7, 8 was a resolution passed before the first Gulf War when um, Iraq had invaded Kuwait and we were trying to get Iraq out of Kuwait. 6, 8, 7 was the ceasefire after the uh, exit of um, Iraq from Kuwait. <coughs> 1441 was a resolution passed um, some three months before the start of the Iraq War. Round two. Um, and what the, the essence of the government advice was that we were reviving Article, uh, sorry, Security Council Resolution 678687. And it was that revival argument which was put forward by the um, Lord Johnson. I would say that, um, having heard Ben Griffin this morning, um, exactly the same thing as happens to ordinary soldiers happens to uh, the Prime Minister and others. 
um, the Lord Goldsmith was asked to advise on the legality or otherwise of the war with Iraq. If you look at his 11 page secret legal advice to the Prime Minister, it had nothing to do with the legality of the war with Iraq. It was put up in order to try and ensure that they could find a way through of carrying out the war. And it, Sorry, the secret stuff came out of the Children of Glory, didn't it? Uh, it came out before that, actually. It came out in 2005, after a bit of pressure. Yeah. There were various memos and other things, but the key one in terms of the legality was that documentation on which the British government's legal position was, was founded and has been founded ever since. What did, um, what did the resolution say? Can you briefly? Um, I haven't got them right here with me. I, what, it, it's very important to have a look at them in detail. Um, it's summary, it may be possible to have a, I'll try and get a copy over lunchtime and if uh, we'll find how to get the answer to that one. But in brief, basically, they were trying to find a way around the uh, refusal of the United Nations Security Council to pass a second resolution. What happened was that the, our ambassador, Jeremy Greenstock, was asked to formulate with America a second resolution which would authorize the uh, attack on Iraq. A, a, a second new wave resolution on top of 1441 right. to double give them the... That's it, because 1441 was about continuing the weapons uh, inspections and trying to find out about the weapons of mass destruction. It had absolutely nothing to do with armed invasion or occupation. They knew that, everybody knew that, and they said they would go and try and find get a second resolution which would make the armed intervention lawful. Uh, the other states, apart from America and Britain, the Security Council and other states refused to do so. And they refused to pass what was called the second resolution. So we went to war on the basis of, of one new resolution and two from ten years before. No, that was neither of those resolutions were um, had affected that situation. They were both false uh, deceptions put upon us by the British government. 